I thought somebody was going to pray and read and all kind of stuff. I usually read Just, well, here he is, you know. <laughs> well, it's Sunday. Let's play anyway. Close your eyes. <laughs> and we'll do this for any prayer. God, grant me the strength to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Then it's always better if we kind of invite God in, you know, because that's, uh, that eliminates the search. You know, no way, right here. And so it's great to see you. Good to be here. Going to do the wrap-up session. They told me about the group conscious that just had a ground swell here, and they're going to take a break every 15 minutes or something like that. <laughs> Bunch of wimps. <laughs> That, uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a precarious position. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but it feels good. Yeah, it is good to see everybody. And I, I want to thank you for a good weekend. I've had a great time with you guys, and uh, particularly between sessions. Yeah, that I, I honestly believe that's where you get the most important work done. And so I really appreciate the time I've had to spend with, with, with a number of, of individuals. There you go. There you go. Fixing it again. <laughs> okay. The president's getting carried away with his job. <laughs> uh, so this morning we want to want to kind of put a wrap on 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 uh, what we started out with a really pretty grim story about David and and and. Uh, and, and, and what happens to a guy who doesn't do the whole program, you know, who just sort of skims the surface and survives. And, uh, and, and just, just like many of us have experienced, uh, you watch that, watch what happens, you know, when that runs out and it comes to a tragic end sitting in the middle of a solution. But the solution doesn't mean anything if you don't do it. And, and so what we, we've dealt with you know, in, in looking at the causes and conditions in the first six steps where we're identifying what is it that sort of wears us down and all of that, and then we start getting into the change process, you know, that for a decision to change. You want to keep that or you want to go for something new? You know, you know, just a little decision there, six and seven. And then eight and nine, we spent some good time on that with, with how to get rid of that wreckage that will drag you forever. And so we deal with that. And now we, we are, we're moving into... Uh, and so then what? And then what? And the then what is what I think really makes a difference. And uh, so when you get through with the promises and it, uh, and, and, and it makes all those declarations, we then move into what I think is, some people see them as deep meditation and stare at your navel steps. I don't find it that way. I find that 10, 11, and 12 are terrific action steps. They're not just for contemplation and meditation and all that stuff. They're about girding up for duty and, hit, and hitting the road. And, and so I want to sort of get, go through that this morning and, and uh, take a look. And I, I, I put it in terms of my experience, so keep me from preaching. And, uh, and then we'll do the homework assignment too, that uh, you all grown. Now, you, know, you can do whatever you want to the homework assignment. It's going to be a suggestion. And... Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to make that suggestion to anybody who finds being sober in AA a little boring or a little dull or, or not as excited as you'd like to see it. <laughs> for people like that, I would especially like to encourage the, the homework assignment. And so, when uh, just to prove I'm a read, I can read, I'm going to actually start out with a reading in the test step. So it finishes that those promises and all the wonderful stuff is going to happen and they're already starting to happen before we're halfway through with that first part. Then when we finish that, finishes that, and we, with these extravagant promises, we think not. And then here's where we go from there. Are these extravagant promises we think not? They are being fulfilled among us, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. They will always materialize if we work for them. This thought brings us to step 10, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living as we cleaned up the past. 
We have entered the world of the Spirit. Our next function, and this is where the action starts for me, our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It it should continue for our lifetime. Let let me dwell on that just for a minute. In the world of the Spirit, our next function, because there's things I want to really key on is what that next function is. To, 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 to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Now this is just, uh, even which one of us reads this book may read a little something different, so you're welcome to whatever you believe. But what I believe is that growing in understanding does not mean insight and wisdom about myself. It's not just a continuation of inventory. To grow in understanding and effectiveness. And, and so... What I want to do, and we talked about it a little bit in an earlier session, I want to understand when things don't work well. I want to understand why they don't work well. I want to understand how things that keep the growth from occurring crop up and what to do about them. You know, so I want, to, I want to continue to grow by putting that, trying to understand what happened. The example I used, and, uh, it was, and, and, and we'll use again, is, is what is it that causes people to come into a, a group of folks where friendship is readily available, a fellowship that you don't have to create is already there, and take a look at it and walk out? You know, what is it that does that? What is it that we either fail to do or, or should do that, that, that causes people who are dying of an illness to turn their back and walk away from it? And so I want to understand that. You know, and I, I really don't want to just demonize the, the, the guy or gal who comes in and can't handle it. I want to understand, uh, do we have a welcoming environment? Are we somebody who makes people feel like they're in the right place instead of the wrong place? Yeah, so there, that's, that's the kind of understanding that, that I want to have. And, and, and are there better ways? Like, let me give you an example of uh, just one thing, and, and, and there's a whole a bunch of things that that's triggered with me. But let me give you an example of just one thing that... Uh, well, it might be more than that. I, I lie sometimes. <laughs> but at least one. That I was bothered for years, many years, with people being mandated into Alcoholics Anonymous and having to bring in some goofy little piece of paper and get somebody to sign it. And I always thought that is the most demeaning tactic I've, I've seen. And I just didn't like it. And... Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't sign them, but I have never made anybody carrying the paper uncomfortable. Never did say, no, I don't do that. You know, we don't do that here. Never done that. It's bad enough to come into Alcoholics Anonymous where you're unsure of it, then to be greeted by somebody who makes you feel like a dope for being there. So I never have just said, no, I don't do that. I wimp out is what I do. If somebody asks me, I'll say, no, no, I, I tell you what, he can handle this. He's got his own personal pen. He'll be glad to do it. Yeah, so and what I'm doing is wimping out, you know, because, because I'll get somebody that doesn't mind doing that. I'm somebody who does. And so I'll help him find a person that'll do it and take care of business. And yes, but, but, but it bothered me for a long time about why do, why does that bother me so much? And, um, uh, I did a thing, I, 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 I mentioned the other day, I do a, a lot of my best thinking when I'm locked up in an airplane somewhere. And, and I, I was at a point where I really wanted to see if we couldn't launch a charge to do something about that, to change it. I brought, I brought it up in, a, in our corrections committee in our group one, one night. I said, how would you guys feel about trying to get something done about the court slip thing that's, that's done? And an old guy that I sponsored said, oh, hell, Tom, we can't do a thing about that. They do it all over the country. I said, well, let's don't fix the whole country. Let's just work right here in Mayberry. And uh, he said, well, we can try, but it won't get done. I said, okay. And so I was flying one day, and I started thinking along the line of advantages and disadvantages. You know, that draw a line down the legal pad. What's good about this? What's bad about it? And so I put on the good side, what's good about it? came up, and I, I think I was being as honest and open and generous as I could be, and I came up with ten things. All ten of them had value for the person supervising the guy with the paper. 
your probation officer. They had great benefit for them. <laughs> there were two that I put a question mark beside because maybe during a lunar eclipse it might have some value for the person. But <laughs> it was a skeptical entry, I'll tell you that. But I wanted to be generous, and so I put two down. Didn't believe it, but just threw them in. And uh, skippy list, eh? Then I started listing what's wrong with it. And I think I quit at 26 things that, that I found to be extremely objectionable about that. And they were the same thing if we did a brainstorming session right now. They're the same things we'd come up with. You know, and it makes a same person feel like a second-class citizen. It's like he's coming in with a brand on his head. you got to come in in some, some sort of a, a cowering approach to somebody. Would you sign this paper for me? You, you know, it, it just is a terrible way to treat a drunk. And, and when I thought about those things, I, I thought about what a contrast it is to where A started. And, and, and you all know the story of, you know, of how Abe, Abe got captured one more time for shooting up his little old town and was getting ready to go to jail again. Nothing new with that. And some people d decided to try to bail old Abe out. And they, uh, one of them was a guy named Roland Hazard. I visited his grave just a, just a while back in uh, Narragansett, New uh, Rhode Island. And, and uh, we did a little goodbye Roland thing. And it was, so it was connected with a piece of our history, and and and, and you know that story, you know, that these uh, uh, Roland Hazard and, and and two other people went approached the judge and said, "Don't put Abby in jail. Let us have it." And so, well, the judge had nothing to lose. I mean, the guy's a town clown anyway. You don't have to go hunt him. He'll be back knocking on the door. So they said, "Yeah, take him." <laughs> and so <laughs> they took him, and they started working with Abby. And then, then the, the rest is history with you know, how that culminated with his contact to Bill. And it really was where the ball started rolling that created Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and it came out of a court thing. But now, contrast that. Contrast that picture to a judge who's looking at three citizens who says, let us take care of this guy. Contrast that to the judge says, you're going to AA, get that paper signed, and if you don't, you're going to jail. 180 degrees, eh? At least 180 degrees away from that whole notion. And now what we've done is made a human process into almost a production line. It's almost a mechanization of, 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 of what ought to be a human service. And, and, but it's where it's come to. And so when you, when you start dealing with that, I think all of that goes in. And so when I started trying to understand that, that's what I'm doing. I'm listening there. What are the possible, what are the problems with it? And, and it was just, just a whole bunch of stuff. The second class citizen, having to walk in, the patronizing position of, of, of being just, just drug around. And there are 26 things on there. The one, the sixth one down was, was an interesting one. It explained to me why I didn't like to sign the papers. It's because it would change the nature of my relationship to an alcoholic. It makes me something other than another alcoholic. It makes me sort of a quasi-probation officer. I'm, I'm a, a sort of a, an errand boy for the probation system. I have no interest in doing that. I don't want to be an authority. I don't want to be a certifier or ratifier or anything like that. The only thing I want to be to an alcoholic is another alcoholic. That's all. And when I start adding to that and put, put any kind of vestige of authority or anything like that, what I'm doing is sabotaging my effectiveness. And that's why I wouldn't sign them. I never had thought about it until I started writing that out. <clears throat> well, we set up a meeting with the, the, the head person. We didn't go to a judge. We, 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 we knew a judge that we could get, work with effectively. But you don't want to throw your hardest shot the first time out of the barrel. You want to warm up a little bit, you know, and save him for the kill if you need him. So that's what we're doing with him. But we didn't tell him what we're doing. And we set up a meeting with the, the fellow that was in charge of probation in that region, the state. And uh, Peter, don't leave, boy. You need to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's possible I wouldn't beat him up like that. But he's uh, he, he, so we set up this meeting with this guy, and he was a typical kind of guy. You, you anybody in a public facility when citizens come calling? 
makes them nervous because they're used to people attacking. You know, they've got a complaint. They don't come to condemn for what you're doing. It's always an attack. Why are you doing that? This kind of stuff. So we walked in this fellow's office, and me and we had just started our group, and uh, the chairman of the CPC committee was a guy I sponsored, and, and he had never done a CPC job, so I went with him to help him with, with, with doing this thing. And uh, he... So we go in, and this guy's sitting behind this big desk in the defensive posture. You know, he was ready for whatever we threw at him. And so we howdy do and all that stuff, and then uh, told him what we're about, and then handed him the thing. He started reading down that list, and I think it was number six that said, it changes the nature of who I want to be to an alcoholic. He said, well, I'll be damned. I never thought of that. I said, me either. But the other day I was flying, 35,000 feet right, right next to God. And, 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 and he told me to say that. And I said, well, I mean, how's he going to fight that? I mean, my God, it's me and me and God right there. And so, and so but from then on, you would have thought he worked for us. Well, he did work for us. But, but you would have thought he literally was on our team. So that, um, he, once he understood it. Yeah, he said that just makes eminent sense. And from then on, it was a piece of cake. That was a done deal with just that one little item. And so we decided, what, 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 what do you want to do about it? Yeah. Well, now, my belief is just mine, but it works pretty good. I don't ever go to public officials with a problem that I don't have a solution for. It's kind of like a good lawyer never asks a question in a court that he doesn't know the answer to. If you got one that does that without knowing the answer, you've got a bad lawyer. And so I don't ever go to a public official and say, here's a problem. What do you think we ought to do? Most of the time, what they think we ought to do is not what we want to do. Get something different. And so he, he said, what are you doing? We were ready. I think we'd laid out four, four suggestions that we thought would be better. One of them, the one they settled on, was put the weight on the guy. It's his problem. Why are you going to solve it for me? Why are you going to make a rabbit dog out of your probation officer? You look like a fool trying to chase down an alcoholic. Good God, man. That's like. <laughs> well, he readily agreed that it was a kind of foolish plan. And so he said, put it to wait on the guy. Now, so if the guy's got a drinking problem, he, he'll know it. You may not want to admit it, but he'll know it. And tell it, uh, man, you got a problem. You're going to need to do something about this. Look it over. And then tell us what you want to do to solve it. And if you come back with a good plan, we'll, we'll endorse it. If you don't, we'll send you back and say that doesn't, that's not adequate. See what I'm talking about? That put the responsibility on the guy. It's his problem. Put the responsibility on him to start taking some action, eh? Rather than trying to coerce and force change, you know. And uh, so they jumped on, on that thing. And uh, you know, if you want to verify it, let him tell you how he's going to verify it. You know, put the weight on the fellow with the problem. They let him have the ownership, and that way he can have some ownership of, of, of the victory if there's one, instead of just being said. We had a, we had a good friend named Harry Tebow that, that many of you I know have read. And Harry, Harry Tebow wrote about the difference between surrender and compliance. And when you have compliance, you have no ownership. No ownership. What you have is conforming to somebody else's plan, and you give up your ownership. It makes success almost impossible. And surrender means when you give up and what comes will be yours. And that's exactly what that court system is. Now, we didn't use that kind of language with it, but that's exactly what it is. If somebody's just complying with somebody else, they'll do it as long as the master's snapping the whip. And when you're not snapping the whip, the behavior stops. And so that's what we did. We let the guy carry the weight, let him submit the plan. Then you just supervise the person, just like you're supposed to do. Well, they jumped on it in a heartbeat. They said, well, would you meet with the rest of our folks and talk with the officers, just help them be aware of what we're trying to do here? And so we did. We invited them to come two at a time so they wouldn't feel alone. To visit the group, take a look at the environment. The only thing we ask, don't come packing. You know, you know, with some of our folks still nervous. When they see a gun, they uh, flinch a little. So tell them to come clean. You know, don't, don't pack iron. 
And, and so they agreed to that. And, and so that's where we're off and running. And uh, it was simple, right? It, it, that's understanding and effectiveness. What's the problem and what can we do to make it better? That's all it was. Just a simple little exercise. But to me, that's what that's about. It's not about studying me. I let you uh, bring Pete back, will you? <laughs> oh, he's back. Good God. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> maybe lose my place. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we're, we're, we're off and run to that. I, I tell you, the overall surrounding for what, what we're talking about here, now this is just obviously just my deal, but I think once you leave the promises, everything remaining, 10, 11, and 12, starts with me. None of it ends with me. None of it ends with me. Starts there and then moves on to others. You know, what was wrong with David? He was studying his illness. You know, he was studying his desperate hanging on. Instead of learning how to be functional and be of useful purpose, learning to be of service, find a joy in helping others, what he did was study himself. And what I've noticed is that people who study themselves always get worse, never better. And so these steps are designed to make me free. And so growing and understanding and effectiveness doesn't mean studying me. It, it means how to make my life and my, my, my role in life to have meaning and value. And, and so that's exactly what that was. And, and so we, we started out with that. Now, that was a relatively simple process. It was the, uh, it was the, uh, I tell you what, that boy, when he wakes up, that is one wicked looking dude when he wakes up. He, <laughs> that was the first thing I saw this morning was him. He comes <laughs> Maybe we won't go back to bed. I tell you. <laughs> Rough looking boy. <laughs> he's, your, he's yours. You're responsible. <laughs> we we got to grow him and understand it. <laughs> but anyway, yo, know, Dad, what a great thing, eh? You know, and in 14 years, we've never had a single piece of paper in our group. If people ask me if we still get people from probation, I can't tell you how proud I am to tell you I don't know. It's none of our business. We don't check resumes at the door. We don't give a rat's ass who comes out. <laughs> who cares? I mean, well, nobody comes in here because we own a roll, you know, and say, man, I just won the lottery. I thought I'd join A. <laughs> Baloney, you. We come in here because we're beaten up by life, you know, and so, so it's a good feeling, eh, that, that we don't have that kind of thing going on. Somebody brings a paper in that group, it's usually wanting somebody's phone number or whatever, but anyway, just, it's just one little example, just one little example of, of what that whole business means of, of understanding effect. If I don't like the way my group's going, you know, that, uh, you take a little thing I used yesterday, you know, that I don't want to just, just make a lot of noise and stuff. I want to try to understand problems. And to me, that's what, what this 10th step, ten step is about. It's, 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 it's to grow in, 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 in understanding effectiveness. And right below that, there's a kind of a marching order, I think, that, that sort, of, sort of spells the tempo for this kind of thing. To grow in understanding and effectiveness. And if you think about that, you know, part of your homework is to think about, and I'll tell you a little more specific about that, but in, in your own community, you, know, you don't need to worry about the world, but just the spot of, of, of this part of British Columbia that you live in. You know, what I want to ask you to do is focus on that and then, and then use, use some of what we're talking about here. That is, if you want to find joy instead of survival. For well, David never got to the point of looking for something that would get him out of himself and into a real purposeful life, eh? And so what this does is, is it moves us into a useful life. And it's no longer about studying me. It's about finding my place and carrying out my purpose. What's my primary purpose? And to right below that, that continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. 
And you certainly, we're human beings. If what we get restored to in AA is human, most will ever be. Doesn't mean we're super superhuman. We're going to be like anybody else. We're going to get restored to life, and we're going to goof from time to time. That's just natural. That's what human beings do. And so we're going to goof. But if we goof, that doesn't mean we need Freudian therapy. You know, we don't need to get into doing another inventory and going into some massive hunt. That's life. I mean, and most of what we do is simple stuff. You know, you do something goofy, I step on your toe and say, hey, man, sorry about that. It's not a federal case, yeah. And so a lot of times it's a federal case to us. You know, we'll just sort of magnify the whole thing and make something big out of it. But I think what he's saying is that we, we get restored as a human being and we function like human beings. And don't need super therapy just to get through life. You know, when we, when we go, handle it immediately. And then, you know, what it says there, that when, when, we, when these things crop up, that dishonesty or you know, those old characters, when they drop up, when they crop up, uh, we ask God to remove them. We discuss them with someone immediately, this is part of what sponsors are for, and make amends quickly if we've harmed someone. It's, uh, you don't have to make a case out of it. You don't have to do a long study on it. If you goof up, quicker the better. Yeah. Say, hey, look, I'm sorry about that. I goofed, and I'll try not to do that again. It's not a federal case. And uh, sometime with us, uh, well, <laughs> anyway, we can tend to magnify stuff. We get a toothache, we've got to think about have false teeth. And so that's, that's just, just life. So we go over with somebody, take action, and, 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 and make amends if, we, if we've harmed somebody. And uh, easy, quick stuff. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Immediately turn our thoughts to someone we can help. Not dwelling on me and my foibles and how terrible I am, but just, just that I'm participating in life like every other human. And this is just giving us a map how to deal with that stuff and how to move on and, and get into useful purpose. Love and tolerance of others is our code. And we've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Yeah, I'm not mad at booze, not at all. I like to see people drink. I really do. I'm fascinated with them on planes. I see people that, uh, I guess I'm really looking for customers or something. I, but I, I watch them <laughs> and see their old mannerisms and stuff. But anyway, that's a, that's a whole deal. The love and tolerance of others is that kind. Yeah, live and let live is what we call it. You live and let live. We don't need to live other people's lives and all that kind of stuff. We've got to be tolerant of other people. We've ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. Don't need to fight anything. Now, there's some causes I fight, you know, but I don't get into personal battles too, too much with uh, stuff, but there's some causes, some things I believe in and I fight for and all of that kind of thing. Uh, but that's just being a good citizen. For this, By this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally and we'll find that this has happened automatically. We'll see that our new attitude toward liquor, toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. Now, this gets a little squishy. This, so, you know, I always like to get a real reality base in this, this thing because it can sound a little bit... Uh, ethereal with, with, with what's going on. New attitude has just been given to us. Of course, we did work nine steps on the way to it being given to us. You know, so it's not exactly a free gift. You know, it's a product of, of what we've done up to this point. The uh, No effort on our part other than the nine step. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We're not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We've not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. And, and uh, I'm thankful for that. I also like to be very conscious that it's been removed, but it hadn't been moved far. <laughs> it's sitting right over there. And all i got to do is revert to some old behavior, and I guarantee you that sucker will be back sitting on me again. You know, so I, I don't want to get too unrealistic about that and say, oh yeah, she's gone. <laughs> Never to return. It's easy to return. Easy. 
and does. You know, we've all seen that stuff. We're neither cocky nor we're afraid. That's our experience. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. The minute the spiritual condition deteriorates, look who's knocking at my door. And so that's kind of a thing. It sounds real wonderful and squishy and wonderful. But the reality is that I've got to have these principles in place if I want the immunity. You know, otherwise, I'm just another struggling human. You know, and, and so using these tools is easy. It's easy to let up on, this, on the spiritual program of action and rest on our laurels. What's a laurel? Past achievements. What? Achievements. Achievements? Past achievements. What about Hardy? What's that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, that holds up the law, I guess. <laughs> it's <laughs> Peter, you made me lose my place. <laughs> well, I've got it. Yeah, you can show, show everybody's got a purpose. Yours is being an agitator. <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> Oh, yeah, thank you very much. That's a Detroit. That's a Detroit philosophy, right? There. Law is it, man? Go for it. <laughs> uh, we didn't realize we were homeboys. We lived in the. We, if I won't tell if you don't. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we survived Detroit. Uh, well, I swear to God. Well, Peter, I just wanted to see if you'd show off. <laughs> it's so it's, uh, <coughs> you know, yeah, and, and you, here, thank you, Peter. Got me back there. We're, we're not, we're headed, not rest on our laws. We're headed for trouble if we do. Alcohol is a subtle foe. We're not cured of alcoholism. What we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. Awfully important word, Joe. That's all we have is a, is, is a daily reprieve. And if that's spiritual condition, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate in that, that I've been sober since day one. And I wouldn't take, take that for anything on earth. I, 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 I absolutely could. I don't know what I'd have done if I'd have gone back. I may not have come back. So nobody does. But it's, it's not just good fortune. I've been absolutely blessed and, and well trained to how to deal with stuff. You know, when, when, I was, when I was probably four or five years sober, there were times when, when I would absolutely get so overwhelmed with an obsession to drink that I, I could not, I just did not believe I could get through it. Where, for whatever reason, you know, that, that, uh, that, I guess that spiritual defense is down enough, and that thing would just overwhelm me. First time it ever happened was on a plane. You know, I was flying to Detroit. And I, that may be part of what was wrong. I was flying to Detroit. And uh, I, I, I wasn't used to being on a plane sober, and they were serving booze. Now, I'm a spiritual giant. You know, I mean, I hadn't thought about a drink for a long time, and... Uh, was a 12 step in folks. I was around booze all the time, never even had an inkling of a desire. On that plane, the gal started pushing that little buggy up the aisle, and people asking, like they didn't know what it was, what is that? You know, and it, well, that's rookies trying to drink, what that is. And they, <laughs> so, and so I, I listened to, the, to, to her selling that stuff. All at once, I was absolutely overwhelmed. With the, with, with, with the uh, an absolute obsession to drink. I hadn't thought about it. You know, I was as active in the program as a human could be. I'm on the way to do something very, very worthwhile in, up in the state of Michigan. You know, there's absolutely no crisis of any kind that I knew of. And all at once, I was just like old Victor E. walking in front of that saloon. That, you know, I was overwhelmed. I, I knew I was going to drink, and I knew I didn't want to drink. I, honest to God, didn't want to drink. I took a dollar. That's what a drink cost me. I, I, the other day, it was seven bucks for a for a beer or something, or whatever, something seven bucks. It was a dollar back then. 
And I took a dollar out of my pocket, put it in my shirt pocket, and I'm sitting there sweating bullets. What do you do? You call your sponsor? <laughs> right. Even mine couldn't get there from there. You know, what do you do? Right. Right. Good idea. Very good idea. I'm glad you woke up. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Yeah, when you when you don't know what to do or where to turn, that's the last resort and the best resort. And that's what I did. I just prayed the simplest prayer man has ever heard, and the most important one: God help me. Happened immediately. <coughs> Obsession was gone. And, and not for good, because that happened a number of times in my first five years of sobriety, where that, that urge would come over me so overwhelmingly strong. I learned, I learned two things that were vital to me. Yeah, one was pray, always pray. The other was hold on. Pray as hard as, I, as if every bit of it depends on God. Hold on as if it all depends on me. And that's what I did every time. You know, of going through. And so this notion about, you know, I'd always like to, to spend a little time on that because it gets this notion that there's something wrong if you just happen to have an overwhelming urge to drink. That's called alcoholism. Yeah. And if you got stuff that'll start running out of whack, you know, that and, and, and nobody's in perfect tune all the time. And so easily can trigger that old deal. I know what the solution is. I know the ease and comfort that comes from a drink. Nobody knows it better than me. And so naturally, my instincts would go there. And so that, that's I always like to sort of keep that uppermost in my mind. Now, I haven't had an obsession to drink for, for well over 40 years. But if I had one in Vancouver today, I would not be surprised, nor would I be unprepared. I am prepared for battle. Now, I'm not expecting any, but I'm alcoholic. I didn't used to be. I'm alcoholic. And all I got to do is just let that spiritual thing down a little bit and look who's knocking. And so I, I like to be very realistic about that. You know, it's a matter of how well I keep this spiritual life going, how well do I keep tuned in, how well do I keep, keep focused on what I'm about, that you know, if I sit around analyzing my problems and all that kind of stuff, probably deep trouble. Mr. President, you're going to tell me when to... When, huh? Are you, are you saying that? Well, it's a terrible place to stop. You know that. <laughs> yes, he's a tough boss. That's the toughest boss I've had for a long time. Yeah, the, uh, let me see. I'll finish off on that thing, and then we'll drink coffee and uh, whatever. Yeah, probably get out there and tell lies and all that. Lose all, lose all the spiritual stuff, and then we'll come back in and pump it back up. <laughs> so, uh, it, it doesn't exist. It's high react as long as we keep fit, spiritual condition. But, but that bottom line, I think we've said it uh, uh, repeatedly that that when I let up on that thing, all bets are off you know, because that defense is gone, and then I'm right back to who who I am. I don't have a permanent condition called sobriety. I, I have a spiritual condition, and if it stays tuned, I'm in good shape. I'm bulletproof almost. But all I got to do is let up a little bit and look out, look out. How long you want to break, Mr. President? Uh, ten minutes. Sir? Ten minutes? Seven, yeah. ten minutes? Ten minutes. Yeah. Now, ten minutes, not an AA ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs>